JP Tips and Tricks. My name is Phil Schwartz. As you can see from the opening slide, I'm going to cover a number of functional areas within GP. Some of these uh, tips and tricks are just going to be really quick and easy things that you can begin using today. Uh, some of the things I'll show you will take some additional setup and, and possibly some additional instruction, but are, are well worth them. I also want to note that if you're on an older version of GP, some of the things I'm going to show you you may not have access to if you're on a, an older version. My hope is that, that you'll pick up some, some quick tips and that you'll see a couple of things that will allow you to uh, do your work quicker and retrieve your information in a more useful manner. So without further ado, let's get started. I've got a few things that I want to show you that are I call uh, navigation or system-wide. We're going to show you some keyboard shortcuts, the control L for lookup, the alt underline, the control W for closing your screens. We're going to look at how to do some uh, quick and easy data entry. I'm going to show you the save next arrow that actually takes you to the next record. And we're going to look at macros for a little while that probably have 101 uses. In my mind, least used uh, feature that has a, a lot of bang for the buck there, or a lot of bang for the amount of time you put in learning it. So let's switch over to GP. And the first thing I want to show you, I'm in the purchasing module. I'm going to work from the transaction entry screen. And this is really useful if you just want to keep your fingers on the keyboard instead of switching back and forth uh, to the mouse. And I would just tab. I'll tab in a little description. All right, in the vendor ID, normally if you're not sure what the vendor ID is, you would switch to your mouse at this point in time and do a lookup. You can do that using your control L keys. And just like uh, just like with the mouse and the lookup key, you could put a letter in before you do or a number of letters in before you do the control L and it will advance to that spot. I'll accept that and still using my keyboard only. I'll move on. We'll put a fake document number in. And let's just say we have a $100 invoice. And now at this point, I want to go and do my distributions. That's where the second shortcut comes in. And most of you know this uh, as Windows users in general. Let's say I want to go to distributions. And I'm going to use my mouse just to, to point down here at the bottom where I'm talking about. But if I want to go to distributions, I either have to pick up my mouse to go there or I have to do a bunch of tabbing to get there. But if you do an Alt-B, so anytime you see an underline any, an, under any word or button, you can use the Alt key plus that underlined letter to get where you want. So from here, I'm going to use the Alt-B. It's going to open up my distributions. I'll make whatever changes I want to make, and I'll do an control W to close this screen and then I can save it. So it just keeps your, your fingers on the keyboard throughout the uh, data entry process and uh, might simplify it, might, might make it quicker for you. The next thing I want to show you is the date entry. GP defaults to what the system date is. I'm in the test company so it thinks that it's March 12th of 2017 and that's the default date that this document's using. But normally you'd have your system date, it'd be 720 or 721 I guess, would be the default date that would come up here. Let's say I want to change this to the uh, 5th of August 2017. Instead of typing the entire date or instead of pulling up the calendar, which many of us do, pretty simple move, you could just type in here a 5 and then tab and it'll keep the same month and same year. Likewise, if you wanted to change to uh, January of 2017, let's say January 31st, when you're on this field, you can type 0131 and tab. And it'll use the current year. That's kind of a nice feature. Let's say I typed that wrong, and I had 0130, and I thought, oh, that January really has 31 days. Since the default in this field is January 2017, all I have to do is type 31. 
So that's the data entry made a little, a little easier. We're going to talk about the save next arrow. So let's say we're in the vendor cards and we're updating a bunch of uh, UPS zones. And I update my UPS zone and then I hit the save key. Well, it looks like I now have to find where I was and using the lookup, go there. Well, I don't really remember where I was to start with, so it's kind of a frustrating process. GP actually knows where you are. All you have to do is hit the next record key. And it brings up the next record. An alternate way to do this is to make your change, press the next record key, It'll ask if you want to save the changes. You confirm, and it takes you to the next record. We're going to look at doing a macro to simplify this. And as I uh, originally stated, the macros have probably 101 uses. Uh, as an end user of the product, I was an end user of GP for a number of years as an accountant. Uh, I probably did not take advantage of, of uh, the macro capability, and I. I don't know that as I go around to different clients that I really see them using it. I want to give you a little exposure to it. And what I want to do is I want to use the same example of updating the UPS zone. So what I want to do is I want to say um, that there's basically three keys that I'm going to hit after I update the zone. I'm going to want to save the record. I'm going to want to hit the next record and then I want to locate my cursor in that field. That's, that's the macro I'm going to write. So I'm going to go into my tools. I'm going to choose macro. I'm going to record. I'm going to give it a name. I'm going to call it next UPS field 2. I'm going to save it. Right now I'm in record mode. Those steps that I want to record. I want to go to the next record. I want to save it and I want to position my cursor in the UPS zone field. Now I'm going to go to my tools, to my macro, and I'm going to stop recording. Okay, now all of you are probably telling me that's a lot of work just for to save three keystrokes, and I totally agree with you, it is a lot of work. But we're, what we're going to do is we're going to create a shortcut. So I'm going to go to the home page, which is where all the shortcuts are located. I'm going to click, I'm going to right click in the navigation pane. Then I'm going to choose add, and I'm going to choose add macro. It wants a name. And the trick about all this is that I'm going to uh, use my F keys, my function keys, as a shortcut key. So I'm going to name this F7, just to remind me what key I'm going to assign to it, and I'll, tell, I'll call it next UPS field, and then I'm going to look for the macro, and that's the macro I just wrote, next UPS field 2, and as I said, I'm going to assign it shortcut key F7. I'm going to press add, and done, and you'll see that now in my navigation pane, I have this shortcut called uh, F7 next UPS field. So now, when I'm working in the vendor records, let's say I, this, this uh, ComNet Enterprises is a UPS zone 5, I now hit my F7 key, and it takes me to the next record. It does the save, the next record, and it positions my cursor in the UPS zone. 4, so I'm going to say that this is a zone 4, I'm going to hit my F7 key, and I'm ready to do the next record. F7 key, next record. It might find some faults with, uh, with your data, in that this needs an address before it will save, which it would no matter whether you're using a macro or not. But in general, your hands are on the keyboard. I'm just doing F7, entering a UPS zone. F7, entering a UPS zone. Um, it's a relatively simplistic use of the macro, but if you were trying to update a couple hundred records with UPS zones, or even vendor account numbers, or comments, uh, it could be a very useful macro. But if you're only 
updating with three or four possibilities, you could create those three or four possibilities as unique macros. So let's say F5 equals zone two, or, or let's, let's make this even simpler. If we're updating UPS zones, I could say F1 equals zone one, F2 equals zone two, F3 equals zone three, meaning that each of those macros were written with a hard-coded zone in it. So when I get to a new record, I just press the F key that corresponds to the data that I want to put in that field. I wanted to put uh, a six in this field, I'd hit my F6 key, and the F6 macro would type a six, save the record, progress to the next record, and locate the UPS field to the next record. And then I could choose whatever uh, zone key worked for the next field. So macros have, have a lot of functionality. And there might be some, some learning curve to it, but they're, they're very easy to modify. So you can see I have my uh, next UPS field two macro right there. I can go, I can edit it, I can look and see what it's doing. And uh, once you get the hang of it, I think you get a good return for the amount of uh, learning that you put into it. In the general ledger, I think that this first tip, this negative debits, and I could call it negative debits or negative credits, is probably um, uh, the, the, the tip I'm most excited about. I didn't uh, realize about this tip until uh, I was doing some research. Um, you know, a lot of people do tips and tricks seminars, and um, so I've studied a lot of different ones, and I came across this one, and I thought it was, was um, uh, really interesting, really cool, for lack of a better word. Uh, so let's flip over to GP, and in financial, and in transactions in the general transaction screen. As you know, GP, uh, when you're entering amounts in the general transaction screen, it's going to default to either a debit column or credit column based on the typical balance of the account you're entering. So let's say I'm trying to do an adjusting entry. And this is a revenue account. I can go into multi-line mode. and So this is sales. It's a revenue account. And it's wanting to, me to put a credit in. And probably 99% of the time, I want to put a credit in there. But this time, I want to put a debit in. The normal way to do that, either you take your mouse, and you go over and click on the debit field, or you do a shift tab to get to the debit field. This trick is putting a negative sign in front of the debit. I'm going to put negative 100 in here. I'm going to tab off it, and you're going to see it change from a credit of a negative $100 to a debit of $100. I thought that was a, a pretty cool feature. And now I have my reversing entry or my correcting entry. Took $100 away from my U.S. sales retail parts and moved it to U.S. sales finished goods by using the negative $100 in the credit column. All right. I hope most of you know about the back out and correct journal entry and the copy journal entry features. But for those of you that don't use that or are uncomfortable uh, trying it out, I want to do a run through on it. Back in the general ledger, there we are, transactions, general ledger. You can do a correcting entry, and there's two types of correcting entries. Uh, the first one is just a correct, just backing it out. It was just a total mistake. You should never have been in there in the first place, and you just want to get rid of it. The second kind is backing it out and creating a correcting entry. I'm going to demonstrate that second one, and I happen to have a test um, entry to use. I'm going to put that number in there, click OK, and it's going to populate the screen with this entry that I made. I don't know if we can actually see it. No. So it's going to populate the screen, but it populates it in reverse. So the original entry was a $250 credit to account 2100 and a $250 debit to 2101-01. This, and it's got the exact same date, it's got a um, reference that it's going to back out 1539. So it's the exact opposite. I'm going to post it. And now it's going to create the correcting entry. 
the correcting entry looks just like the original entry. It's, it's identical. The only difference is it's got a new journal entry number because it's a unique entry. Let's say that I really wanted to do this entry, but I just wanted to do it in June. I've reversed the original, I've changed the date on the correcting entry, and I post that. So those are, are really great features that the general ledger has, and um, they're things that should be used. It just simplifies, uh, it simplifies so much correcting and changing. Another thing is the copy. If you have a journal entry that you want to copy or you know you think oh I just did this you know three months ago I just made this exact entry you can look up that journal entry number put it in here and it'll create a brand new identical entry you might want to change the date it has a brand new journal entry number and you post it so those are really great features the correct the back out and correct the copy this reconciles subsidiary modules as you know, um, sometimes your checkbook can get out of sync with your general ledger cash account or your payables trial balance can get out of sync with the payables account in the general ledger. GP has a feature called Reconcile to GL. It's located in Routines and it'll do a reconciliation. I'm going to demonstrate doing a bank reconciliation. It's not, it's not, uh, you're not reconciling your checkbook to the bank. You're reconciling your checkbook in GP to the general ledger. In this case, I'm going to reconcile my Uptown Trust account, which is account 000 1100. I'm going to reconcile it for the month of March. So I've got everything in there. I've got a place to save the output file. All I have to do is process it. And it's got what it thinks is today's date, at least in Fabricam world, it's got today's date in there. I'm going to process it, and it's going to create an Excel spreadsheet with three different sections. We'll have to minimize it a bit so that we can see all of it. And that's, that's the vast majority of it. So here's section one, unmatched transactions. Section two is potentially matched transactions, and it does not have anything in it. And section three is matched transactions. Again, this is, this is the same format, whether you're trying to reconcile payables or receivables uh, or checkbook. It'll have these three sections. The matched transaction section is everything that is fine. It, it shows up both in the general ledger and on the left-hand side in the checkbook. So you don't have to worry about those. The potentially matched section says, Hey, I see these two transactions. One, I see it in the general ledger, and I see it in Uptown Trust, but there's something a little strange about it. Maybe it occurs in the general ledger um, on June 5th and in Uptown Trust on June 3rd. So it's saying, you know, they look okay, but, but there is a little problem. You might want to look it over. Most of what's going to happen is in your unmatched section. What this is telling me is that all these transactions are in the general ledger, but they're not in the Uptown Trust checkbook. That's a problem. That's going to be why my two accounts are off. What's nice is that they have dynamic links. You can drill back to the transactions and actually look at it. You can drill back to the source document. So this is a really nice feature. When I was uh, a GPN user, they did not have the checkbook um, reconciliation feature. I think that's a GP 2013 add-on. They did have the payables and the receivables, but I don't think until GP 2013 did they have the, the checkbook. And I could have used that. I spent, um, I spent a good deal of time reconciling checkbooks. And lastly, in the general ledger, I think as of uh, GP 2013 version 2, release 2, uh, you could reverse a year-end close. And again, this would have been a useful feature for me when I was uh, an end user. One of the organizations I worked for tended not to close their books until very late in the following year. Sometimes 
up to the point of filing the 1020 return. So that's, that's September. And uh, needless to say, they had a number of prior year transactions that occurred during the current year. And you know GP handles all of that fine. You just, as long as the period is open, you can post the, the prior current year. And it brings uh, those balances forward. The problem that I had was that I'd have numerous BBF transactions. BBF standing for balance brought forward. And when I or someone else in the department wants to do, wanted to do a reconciliation, we'd, we'd like to have a beginning balance number. Well, when you post to prior year and have numerous BBF transactions, you have numerous balance brought forward transactions. And you have to summarize all those to really figure out what your balance brought forward is. With this feature, I can just do a year-end closing under routines. And I probably said that uh, backwards. I can do a year-end reversal. So I can reverse a historical year. I can open it back up. Another use that you might think of is that you might want to do some posting two years back, and GP doesn't post two years back. Well, if I open up the prior closed year, now I can post to a year that used to be two years historical, or I could go and open that year as well. So it's a really nice feature that gives you some flexibility. All right, we've got a few things in payables management. Um, one really quick and easy is this edit check batch columns. So when you're in purchasing and you're in edit check batch, this section over here gives you uh, really the, the nuts and bolts of what you're uh, needing to, to pay. I don't know if I have a batch out here that I can, there's some computer checks. So it gives you the nuts and bolts. Apparently, uh, we're going to pay Beaumont uh, quite a bit. But what I didn't realize is I could modify those columns. I could say, you know what would be really helpful? If I could see the transaction description as well. Well, I can add that column. So now you have a little extra information. And there's all sorts of columns you could have added. You could have added the terms or currency ID or document number, document date. Just a quick and easy tip. The next thing I want to show you is vendor default accounts. Probably most of you are using these. I hope most of you are using these. Very simply, when we go to the accounts, you can enter an account for default purchases. So when you enter an invoice, that amount will naturally go to whatever account you put here in the defaults. Well, another way to do it, you might have uh, a handful of accounts that you want to use. So if you open this ellipsis button, you can list the handful of accounts here. If you put a check mark, it will actually show up in the distribution screen. If there's no check mark here, it shows in the lookup field. Let's take a look at it. So I've got, I've got three of these checked, three of them not checked. Let's just take a quick look and see how that works. So it assigned it to the 100, uh, Division 100 because that's what I chose as the default. It also displays the three accounts that I chose to display here. If I go to look up, it's going to show everything I had on that screen and only those things I had on the screen. Kind of limits the, the entry person's options, which may be something you want to do. You may want to, to limit what they can put there. Now, while the look up screen limits it, you're still free to put whatever account you want here. So it'll let you enter an account, but it gives you some, some more uh, parameters, kind of keeps your data entry person kind of between the fences a little bit, those vendor default accounts. EFD payments, I'm not going to get into the nuts and bolts of. I'm going to say that a lot of people are going towards EFT payments. It does take a couple hours of setup. You have to gather the information from your, your vendors. You have to get their bank 
uh, routing number, their bank account number, the bank name. Uh, it's helpful to get their email address so you can start sending them remittances via email. There's some setup that you're going to do in your checkbook. You're going to have to work with your bank to make sure that the transmission file uh, is in sync with what they want it to be. So there is some work to do EFT payments, but a lot of people are going that way. They're finding that uh, it's just a, a quicker, easier way to do it. The vendors like those payments. They show up right away. I want to talk about credit card transactions for a minute. Credit card transactions take a little bit of setup. In administration, under company, there's credit cards. I'm essentially talking about when you pay for your uh, merchandise or your employees pay for your, their merchandise using a credit card. I have one set up, I called it uh, AMEX for American Express. The setup is just a credit card used by a company. It's a credit card, not a check card. And I have a vendor that I set up. I also called that vendor AMEX. I don't have to call it AMEX. I could call it uh, something else. And in the American Express vendor, under accounts, I set up a unique accounts payable account. So I set up an American Express payable account. That's really the amount of setup that I have to do. Now when I'm in purchasing, and I have an invoice that I've paid by credit card, I can actually fill in this field here and say, hey, I paid that on a credit card. It's going to ask me which card I used. I'm going to choose the credit card I used. It's not going to be happy with my distributions, but because um, it was thinking it was going to, to the payables account, now it's thinking it's being paid off. So it thinks it went to account 2100 originally. I'm going to update it. And now it's going to go to account 2106, which was the payables account for American Express. When I post this transaction, there's going to be If I, were going, if I were to go to the American Express account, I would see that there was a $100 charge from today to the American Express. And then you would just pay that bill when the American Express bill comes in. It's a nice feature. I'm going to move on to the receivables. There's a couple tools that they used to be part of the Professional Series Tool Library, PSTL. And it had a lot of useful things like the vendor or customer combiner. Let's take a look at that. I'm going to look at the customer side. I've spent a lot of time in purchasing. It's at the very bottom of utilities. And this has two functions. And as I've said, you could do this uh, for your customers or you could do this for your vendors. The customer combiner basically says, you know, it's great. It's great for those companies that have been taken over by a different company. So let's say that Mandola University is now part of uh, Mailer State University. I could do this one at a time, or I could continue to list other combined combinations that I want to happen. Let's say North College became part of uh, North State College and so forth. And then I hit process, and all the data from these customers, this customer, all his data will be combined with uh, mailers and all of North uh, College will be consolidated with Northern. Likewise, you could use this as a customer modifier. I'm going to switch to modifier mode. In modifier mode, I can say, boy, I have these really strange numeric ones that I have no idea who they are. I'm a new person here, and this would be so much better if I put uh, made them alpha numeric. I could take this and I could say, you know, it's Joe's takeout. You can now call it something like that. And I would just hit process and it would take this ID and change all the history for this ID to this ID. And one more feature if you are trying to do 
all your vendors, trying to change, you say, all my vendors are numeric, Phil, this is, this is going to take a long time. Well, all you have to do is create a spreadsheet, a two-column spreadsheet with the old ID and the new ID, and then you can actually import that into this utility. It'll populate these fields and process, process and it'll do everybody. My suggestion, if you're going to do your entire company, all your vendors or all your customers, is that you do a partial list and see how long it takes. So you might want to do, um, you know, all your A's. And if that goes quickly, then you might want to, you know, just go for B to Z, or you might say, oh, it took quite a long time. I think I'll do B to M. I'll break this up into two different runs. Another thing I want to show you in receivables management is can be used in uh, as a vendor or customer. It's the user design, user defined fields. These user defined fields for the customer uh, record or the vendor record are really useful. Uh, you might want to put some kind of priority on them, some kind of classification on them. You know, if you're a, a biotech firm and your customers uh, have blood types that are relevant, you could you could call user to find one blood type. If you're a, you know, just the, the, the sky's the limit. The really nice thing is that in receivables, a lot of the reports use user to find one as a sorting option. The sample data has, I think. Yeah, so they, they use user to find one to tell whether it's retail or wholesale or contract. That's an option. But um, that user to find one and user to find two are really great fields to use, um, to sort reports with, to uh, restrict on your smart lists with. All right. We're going to move over to smart lists now. Um, a couple really easy things you can do in smart list. You can uh, change the default record and default go-tos. So in GP and administration, one thing that I don't have on there is uh, I know Matt likes to add smart list to people's menus, so I'm going to show you how to do that. I'm in the, uh, I should really, I guess I can do it anywhere, but um, from the home page, I'm in the uh, toolbar icon. I'm going to go down to customize. I'm going to add, I'm going to add smart list. And I say I want it to be at the end of my list. And the last thing I'm going to do is it's going to want to show up as an icon. And I want it to be text only. That's what it's saying it's going to do. Okay. So you might, when you hit OK, it's going to add it. And if it, if it uh, adds as an icon, you'll just have to go in there and modify it until you want text only. So now I have a smart list on my toolbar. And before we go into smart list, I want to show you a couple of features in administration under system smart list options. As you'll know in smart list there's a lot of predefined um, smart list for records so accounts, customers, vendors, that kind of stuff. You can actually change the default number of fields. The default number of fields usually is 1000. Well I can say I want it to be 4000. And you can also change the default go to. So I'm going to hit OK to save that. In my vendors, I might want the default go to to see my transaction history. So I hit OK. Now when I'm in smart list, and I go down and I look at my, my vendors, if I were to click on one of these, because I changed the go to, the default go to, Normally it would take me to the vendor inquiry screen, but I've asked the default go to to be the transaction history, uh, transaction inquiry screen. So if I double click on this, it's opening my inquiry screen. So again, to change the default, and that, that only works with these pre-built master records. But to do that, you go to administration, go down to the system, and the very last one, there's the smart list options. You can change, change the max and uh, change the go to.
Okay, a couple of other easy things we want to look at is changing column names. Now this doesn't work with the max records, but if you're going to save this as a favorite, let's see what we have in purchasing. I've got my 1099 vendors. Okay, not the most exciting uh, column names. Let's say I want to change the names. I go to my columns and just type over it. And I just save it. And now next time I come in here, it's going to have this description. When you're exporting to Excel, some of these column names can be very long column names. So the default for this is account description. Well, in my Excel spreadsheet, I might just want that to say description. Again, I can't save that permanently for a predefined, anything with an asterisk is a predefined report. But if I save it as test, it will save with the new column descriptions. All right, in SmartList, if I do a search, I could say, you know, I'm really looking for an account, and it begins either with the section 100, the section 300, or the section 500. Well, I could do account number, and I could say it begins with 1, and OK. And it's just going to show me my 100s. I could go back, and I could say division begins with 3. Well, if I were to hit OK, I wouldn't get any results because I've got this as match all. But I could change that to match one or more, and now I'm going to get everything that begins with division 100 or division 300. One other way to do that, and I'll go back to match all, and I can put square brackets around this. And now I'm saying if it begins with a 1, a 3, a 5, or a 7, I want to see it. Uh, I guess we don't have any 7s. But that's a nice little way to get a little bit more power out of your search. And finally, I'm going to talk about smart list alerts. So what I can do with the smart list, for instance, I have this search for one of my customers Aaron Fitz Electrical. And I want to know anytime Aaron Fitz's balance goes over $20,000. I want to keep a close eye on it. And so what I did was I created this search. I'm really just searching the customer file. I'm doing a search on it where Aaron, uh, where the customer ID is Aaron Fitz 0001. And I'm displaying the customer balance as one of the fields. When I go to save this, I'm going to save it as Aaron Fitz over 20,000. And when I add it, I'm going to add it to my favorite and reminder. And for the reminder, I'm going to say anytime the customer balance column is greater than $20,000, I want to be reminded. I'm going to hit OK. I'm going to close out of that. And on my home screen, you can see that I have this reminder. Aaron Fitz over 20,000 and it shows me the customer balance. Obviously there's a lot of power with making a specific smart list grouping and making it conditional on some factor. You could say, hey, I want to know anytime I have um, a bill for a specific vendor, you want to show it. So a very powerful tool. I'm going to show the document attachment and letter assistant really quick. They're great new features. You know, they've been around for a while, but they're just really great features. Document attachment takes a little bit of setup in the, um, in the administration. So you really just have to activate it. You have to allow document attachments, and um, that's, that's the minimum amount of setup that you have to do. Allow document attachments. You can have a default file for it. Document attachments. For vendors, um, you could add their W-9 uh, tax identification form. For customers, you could add uh, their sales uh, exemption certificates. For invoices, you could, as you're putting your invoices in to be paid, you could actually scan 
it's a staples bill. You could stand the staples, staples bill and attach it uh, to GP. If it's uh, an expense report, you can scan it and attach it. Uh, on sales documents, you could scan the purchase order that you're attaching to the GP purchase. A lot of functionality with it. It's really simple. I'll just demonstrate in the vendor. As long as you see a paper clip, it means you can do an attachment. So for Ace Travel, I can hit the paper clip. If I had a scanner attached, I could just put the document in the scanner and scan it straight from there. Otherwise, I can search my hard drive. It'll look to my default uh, file folder that I set up in the administration. And I'm going to take his uh, exemption certificate. Probably not terribly accurate, but I, that's all I did. I just pressed attach. I went out there. I double clicked on the file and it attached it. Click OK. And now you'll see that that big blue paper clip turns to a white sheet of paper with a paper clip in the upper left hand corner. So advanced office system has nothing. Ace Travel does have something attached. The other thing I want to show you really quickly is the letter writing assistant. I'm going to go into sales. I'm going to go into customers. And this letter writing assistant in customers and in, in receivables management has two types of letters, a collection letter or a, a customer letter. I'm going to look at all the different letters that are available. As you can see from the drop down, there's collection type letters, there's customer, vendor, employee, applicant. What I want to look at is this collection letter. We can edit it if we want, so I'm going to edit the first notice. And this will let you see what the editor look, edit the letter looks like. Or you could create your uh, totally brand new letter, but it's probably easiest to work from an existing letter. This is what the first notice looks like. As you can see, it's got a bunch of mail merge fields. But you know, just a reminder, your invoice is past due. And it's actually going to populate with the balance. We'd be happy to discuss any questions you have. If this payment has already been made, disregard. Uh, we appreciate your business. And I might say, well, I love this letter, but I really, I really want to put greatly appreciate your business. All I have to do to make a change is type it in, save it. I'm going to close this. And I'm going to cancel out of here. I'm going to go back in. I'm going to prepare a collection letter now. And what's really nice is it lets me choose what customers or what vendors or what employees I'm sending this to. And I want to use a smart list selection. I want to use smart list with a user defined field one that equals retail. I click next. I'm going to send them the first notice. I click next. Now it says, okay, these are all the people that met your smart list criteria. And I can say, well, you know what? I don't really want to send this guy one. I don't want to send that guy one. I don't want to send that person one. Everybody else I'm going to send it to. Uh, I'm happy with that. I don't want to include anything else. I'm going to hit finish. And it's going to prepare letters for each of those individuals. As I said, this is just a, a stock uh, collection letter. And you can see it includes the modification I made. We greatly appreciate your business. Phil Schwartz, there's my email address. I have my phone numbers if I chose to put them in there. And it created one for every person in that smart list. And I think that's a great place and a great time to stop. Thank you for coming.